the opportunity to speak to you tonight and and uh, it's always a blessing and uh, you know we should be thankful for media such as we are in using now in order to engage in in the study what i'd like to talk to you about is uh, somewhat related to the uh, class on logic and uh, i think you'll see as we go along but uh, as, we, as we pointed out in our class, you know, uh, knowledge of absolute truth uh, seems to be a mystery to some. Uh, something that is there, they would admit that it's there, but it is never quite attainable. Although one may constantly search for truth, it is never located, even though, uh, at least as some of our, they're getting closer and closer to it as time goes along. Then what happens is that the uh, searcher dies without ever uh, attaining the long search for truth. And then somebody else has to pick up the search for the truth. And of course, neither do they ever locate it. Uh, this thinking says that there is no absolute truth, just your truth and my truth. Which we and we know that's just an illusion, uh, fabrication. But if that is true, of course, there's that word again. What the person is searching for, how would he know he is getting close? Uh, maybe such a one finds your truth, but can't seem to locate his truth. Or for that matter, how would he know if he were straying from the very thing he seeks to discover? One simply cannot know if he is getting closer to the truth or further away from it if there is no such thing as absolute truth. Can we, members of the Lord's Church, claim that we have the truth if no one can really come to a knowledge of truth? To claim such when it is impossible to know absolute truth makes us hypocrites. I deny such is the case. When we talk about coming to a knowledge of truth, uh, we must exclude from knowledge something we convey as the truth, but it is just a fabrication, whether we believe it or not. Can we attain knowledge by lies? Can we approach truth by lies? If I believe that there are pink flying elephants, have I come to a knowledge of truth that is uh, reality? No, now, I, I may be a liar or a hypocrite or delusional, but I do not have the truth. The Bible treats knowledge of saving, saving truth not only as possible, but necessary and obligatory. People who deny the saving truth of the Bible do so without uh, biblical authority. So to those who say to us, we cannot come to a knowledge of truth, well, we'll just go ahead and come to a knowledge of truth anyway. Biblical truth takes some study in thinking about it uh, before it becomes useful knowledge. But there are some truths that cannot be known, that is, become knowledge by man because God has not revealed them. As recorded in Deuteronomy 29, 29, Moses wrote, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the works, words of, his, of this law. So the implication there is there are just some things that are not disclosed and we can't know them. Uh, some things simply have not been revealed by special revelation or in nature. Such knowledge, uh, oh, let's say, is why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, John, third chapter, John, verse two. It is not attainable by diligent study of the word of God or by keen observation of the natural world. As the psalmist said, how precious also are your thoughts to me. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. Psalms 139, verse 17. Or as Paul wrote, Oh, the depth 
of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments in his ways past finding out. That's in the 11th chapter of Romans, verse 33. <clears throat> Even if God had revealed that is uh, in his infinite mind to a finite mind, the finite mind is limited in its capacity to comprehend the infinite. It is God that inhabits eternity, not man. Isaiah 57, chapter verse 15. Although that infinite mind is knowledge and man might perceive it to be the truth, the infinite would be mentally unmanageable by the finite. God has made known and comprehensible to the finite mind things necessary for salvation. When Paul was taken up to the third heaven and was able to view paradise, he was not to allowed to talk about it as it was unlawful to do so. 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verses 1 through 6. The finite man could not comprehend the scope and breadth, the utter magnificence of paradise. Revealed things, uh, things that God expects you and me to know are unknown, not because they remain unrevealed or are beyond man's capacity to understand, but because man chooses not to think, that is, uh, meditate on these things. Philippians 4th uh, chapter, verse 8 and 9. The apostle uh, Peter admitted that some things Paul wrote are hard to understand, 2 Peter 3, 16. But he did not say Paul's writing, uh, writings were impossible to understand. Hard material must be matched by rigorous thought. Rather, as Paul wrote in Romans 1, 28, they chose not to retain God in their knowledge. Christians must build on things first learned and go on unto perfection. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 12, and sixth chapter, verse 1 through 3. All these points uh, have been made. Let's consider a topic that many say one cannot know, but the Bible says you can. Can one know he is a Christian? From creation till now, mankind has suffered many things for many reasons. And that uh, would not be a surprise to anyone. The Bible says in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 15 and 16, that let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. This passage clearly says that one can suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. We have no problems in identifying these malefactors by their actions. The admonishment uh, for, uh, to us is to avoid these actions so that none of you suffer. And then you suffer because of them. Then the 16th verse says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, if anyone suffers as a Christian, how is it possible to suffer as a Christian if it is impossible to determine if one is Christian? If it is impossible to know one is a Christian, it is also impossible to know one is not a Christian. If we cannot know we are not a Christian, why do we even bother to obey the will of heaven? Yet there are those who proclaim that no one cannot know if he or she is a Christian, further proclaiming that only God knows. Well, it, it is true that God knows all things, even the hidden things of the heart, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13. Yet he says we can know false prophets. <clears throat> 
and that's those who teach contrary to the word of God, by their fruits, Matthew 7, 16. <clears throat> if we can know false prophets by their fruits, then we can know true prophets by their fruits. Accordingly, we can make the same determination as to one's status as a Christian by comparing the fruits they bear with the infallible word of God. A Christian bears certain fruits in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 22 and 23. And fruits that a non-Christian don't bear, does not bear, Galatians, fifth chapter, verses 19 and 21. <clears throat> If it is the case that one cannot know if he or she has been saved from their sins, neither can one know if he or she has eternal life. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5.13 that these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have, that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Continuing the thought in verse 13, he goes on to write in verse 14, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He wrote in 1 John 3rd chapter, verses 18 through 20, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. The Apostle John says we can know we have eternal life and we can know we are of the truth. Our confidence and assurance are predicated on this knowledge. Can we know anything? Can we know the truth? Yes, we can. Is truth absolute? That is the same for you and for me? Yes, it is. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus affirmed that they could know the truth and that they would know the truth if they abided in his word. Jesus, in his prayer for his disciples, petitioned the Father to sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, John 17, verse 17. Previously, he said that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. The gospel is the word of truth, and it saves, Ephesians 1, verse 13. Indeed, Paul wrote in Romans, uh, first chapter, verses 16 through 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel, the word of truth, is God's power to save. But only to those who believe. Believe what? The words of Jesus. Since Jesus is as much God as the Father, one can say the word of God and mean the same as the word of, words of Jesus. How can you know if you believe? As the apostle Paul wrote, examine yourselves as to whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. How can you obey from the heart that which you do not believe? Well, you can't or you won't. Paul further writes, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's the 10th chapter of Romans, verses 14 through 17. <clears throat> Not only must the truth of the gospel be believed, it must be obeyed. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, chapter verse 15 and 16. Can one know he believes? Well, Jesus seemed to think that one could believe and be baptized. He also seemed to think that one could fail to believe and thereby be condemned. Paul wrote that God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 16, uh, 6 chapter verses 17 and uh, through 19. Well, will the mere preaching of the gospel, God's power to save, result in the salvation of the tears? No. Paul wrote, for indeed the gospel was preached to us uh, as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse two. Must we take care what? And how we hear? That's for Mark 4th chapter, verses 24 and Luke 8, 18. Well, indeed, uh, we, we uh, must. And Jesus said as much. Can we be mistaken in thinking we are doing good works for the Lord and deceive ourselves? Indeed, we can. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Step in chapter of Matthew, verses 21 through 23. Well, then, uh, can we determine from God's objective proof wh what is required of us? Paul says to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is, we must use logic, 2 Timothy 2nd chapter, verse 15. We do not have the liberty to place any interpretation on Scripture that suits us. But we have an obligation to draw from Scripture what it says explicitly or implicitly. If we can rightly divide the word truth, that is, we must use logic, then we can also wrongly divide the word of truth, that is, we may be illogical. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in, in truth. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John, the fourth chapter, verses 23 and 24. If we can know the truth and know that we know the truth, then we can know that we are Christians or that we are not Christians. The same evidence that gives us knowledge pertaining to our internal uh, inheritance is the same evidence by which we determine that we are Christians, that is, in Christ. And you might refer to Mark 16, verse 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, 1 John 1, verse 7, and 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and 29, chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, 5, verse 11 through 14, and 2 Timothy 1, verse 2, and 1 Corinthians 15, 
58. I hope you wrote those down because I'm not going to repeat them. As God of heaven and earth said to the prophet Isaiah so long ago, and it's recorded in Isaiah, the first chapter, verses 18 through 20. Come now, let us reason together, and that is, use logic. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your skins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What has changed since that time that we are no longer required to use our powers of reasoning? Certainly God, who knows the heart of mankind, hasn't changed. Unfortunately, neither has mankind. But it doesn't need to be that way. Let us reason correctly that our sin may be as white as snow and as wool. Then we can truly know and prove with adequate evidence that we are Christians. And thank you for your time. And may this prove to be a valuable benefit to you in the service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.